targeting three different power distribution utilities in the Ukraine. Uh, shut off power to 225,000 subscribers for up to eight hours. Hello and welcome to Waterfalls Industrial Security Institute. I'm Andrew Ginter with Waterfall Security Solutions and we are working our way through the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. We are using the top 20 cyber attacks to evaluate the strength of security program for two example security programs for a hypothetical water treatment plant. A 2013 vintage program using a lot of software best practices and that same 2013 program with the addition of a unidirectional security gateway deployed at the ITOT interface instead of the ITOT interface firewall. Today's attack is the Ukraine attack. Um, this is an attack that occurred in 2015 uh, targeting three different power distribution utilities in the Ukraine. Uh, shut off power to 225,000 subscribers for up to eight hours, uh, depending on the location of the subscribers. Now, we're targeting a water treatment plant, but it's basically the Ukraine-style attack that I'm going to be describing. And I'll, I'll mention some of the differences between uh, the, this attack and what actually happened in the Ukraine on the end. In our attack scenario, we have a group of hacktivists. These are people who know something about cybersecurity, uh, but they're not professionals. These are people who have some grievance with our water treatment plant and want to target it and shut it down and embarrass the water treatment plant. So what they do, and in this scenario, they do some spear phishing, they do some research, they steal some passwords. They log in to the IT network using those remote access passwords. Once in the IT network, they download attack tools from the internet. These are free tools out on the internet. And they look around, they find passwords, they find password hashes, they eventually gain control of the domain controller with a domain admin account, and they create a new account for themselves. Something like backup-admin-2. Would anybody be suspicious if they see an account named Backup Admin wandering around the network touching everything? Of course not. They do this because if someone gets suspicious about these phishing emails and resets some of the remote access passwords, now they have their own account they can log in on. They have their own passwords they can get in on. So they can log into the jump host, and from the jump host, they go through to the, uh, the industrial network. Once they're on the industrial network, what did they do in the Ukraine? They looked around. They found the HMI workstations. These are the computers that the power distribution grid operators use to visualize what was happening in the physical process and to control the physical process. What uh, the attackers did in the Ukraine, what the attackers do in this scenario, is they find a way to visualize the HMI screens. Uh, back then, they used uh, some, you know, one attacker used, uh, they found a copy of the uh, HMI program, the HMI software, downloaded it to their own machine, logged in through a VPN, and now they could visualize, they could use the screens uh, the same way the operator could, in parallel with the operator. Um, in the other, in two of the other three targeted distribution utilities, the attackers looked at the HMI software and discovered a flag, a setting. And they activated the setting and they said, the operator is our teacher. We are students. Show us everything the operator sees. And now they could see all of the screens that the operator was seeing as the operator navigated through them. They watched the operator, or you know, in the case of the remote user, presumably they looked at the screens for months. And they slowly learned what each of the screens meant and how to operate them. And then when the day came, um, in our scenario, when the day came, let's say they turned the switch from student mode to teacher mode, saying, now I'm your teacher. The operator can watch me. And they start operating the screens. And what they do is they navigate into one large device or one important device after another one. And in the water treatment plant, they might turn off pumps that are supposed to be turned on. They might open gates on water systems, letting water move that isn't ready to move yet, that hasn't been properly treated. In other parts of the distribution system, they might uh, release toxic amounts of chlorine into the water. They might release toxic amounts of fluoride 
into the water. At the very least, what happens now is you have to issue a boil water advisory. We might have people getting sick in the community if they don't hear the boil water advisory or if they consume any of the water with toxic amounts of additives. So it's a fairly serious incident in terms of consequences. In the Ukraine, there was actually not just one attacker operating the HMI. There were at least two and probably more than that. Um, the second attacker had learned their way around the system, had learned how to log into every one of the devices they could on the industrial network. And so wh while the, the first attacker did things to the physical process, when they were done with a certain device, the other attacker would log in and erase the hard drive. Or with a PLC, would erase the firmware. If you erase the firmware thoroughly enough, there's no way to recover the firmware. You have to take the device, the PLC, and throw it out buy another one and bring it in because there's no way to recover any kind of operating software into the PLC. So this is the scenario. Um, it differs from the, the Ukraine scenario primarily because in the Ukraine, uh, this was the, the Ukraine attack was credited to a nation state. Why? All they used were hacktivist techniques. But there were so many people involved that they said, you know, hacktivists have a reputation, they don't generally cooperate in large numbers. You might see one or two or three of them cooperating, but it's very unusual to see 20 or 30 of these sort of lone hackers cooperating. In the Ukraine, they targeted three utilities simultaneously. They had at least two people on each utility, one managing the screens and one or two others logging into the substations, erasing hard drives and erasing firmware. And simultaneous with that, on, you know, on three power utilities, they had another denial of service attack going, targeting the call center for the distribution utility so that customers could not call up and say, hey, I've got no power, can you fix this? The distribution utility was running blind. They had no visibility into operations anymore. Hard drives had been erased. They had no, nobody calling them, saying the lights were out. They didn't know where to send their technicians to solve the problem. They eventually sent their technicians to most of their substations and found 30 of them had been shut down like this. When the technicians reached a compromised substation, I kid you not, they unplugged, physically unplugged, removed the power to all of the computers in the substation, and then manually, bang, moved the bus bar and restored the flow of power into the subdivision. So the point is that with that many attackers cooperating, even though every one of the techniques they used could be downloaded from the internet, could be just a stolen password. They, they were not investing in serious um, attack automation the way a nation state would. The fact that they had so many people cooperating in this attack, the attack was credited to a nation state. In our scenario, it's just a lone hacktivist, or maybe two of them cooperating, one operating the HMI and the other one erasing hard drives. In terms of sophistication, this attack is an example of a medium sophistication attack. These attackers have a degree of understanding of cyber security and cyber attacks. Um, they don't have a lot of resources. They're not using the very latest attack tools. They're using whatever they can download for free off the internet. They're using, you know, they're exploiting permissions rather than exploiting software vulnerabilities because it takes time and, you know, uh, a lot of labor to find zero days and write the tools to exploit them. So medium sophistication, low sophistication on the understanding of the physical process. They had to watch this HMI for months before they decided to act. So presumably they were learning for all of that time. By the time of the attack, they might have had a moderate amount of physical industrial knowledge. But um, at the beginning of the attack, it would seem that they didn't. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend so long watching things. In terms of defenses, how do our security systems stand up to this? Well, in the 2013 scenario, um, how did we get from the IT network into the OT network? We got in through the jump host. They stole credentials and logged in through the jump host. But in 2013 best practice, uh, you know, all of the security guidance of the day says that jump host had better have two-factor authentication. These people are operating remotely. They don't have access to the two-factor system. And so the 2013 software-based, you know, classic security system reliably defeats this class of hacktivist attack because they could not get in through the two-factor authenticated jump host.
In the unidirectionally protected scenario, we again reliably defeat this class of attack, but for a different reason. In the unidirectionally protected scenario, the ITOT interface is a unidirectional gateway, not a firewall with a jump host. It's not possible to log into the control system through this, uh, this unidirectional gateway. You know, your mouse movements physically can't get through into the control system. Um, there are ways, for the record, to do remote access into control systems, but they're more involved. They, they, look more, they feel more like a, a two-factor system. Uh, you know, the most common way, but there's lots of other ways, the most common way is called remote screen view. You have somebody sitting on the inside network, on the industrial network, and they are moving the mouse, operating the keyboard, and talking to an expert remotely. The expert can see the screens, remote screen view, but cannot send any signals into the screens other than voice, through the cell phone into the ears of an individual on the inside who's taking advice. And if the advice they're getting is, you know, go and drop toxic amounts of chlorine into the system, they're not going to do that. So um, again, this class of attack, hacktivist class attack against uh, a, a unidirectionally protected site using uh, stolen passwords to get in remotely is reliably defeated. It simply doesn't work. So if we look at our scorecard, Here's what our scorecard is building up to. Um, we do see an advantage for the unidirectionally protected security program at this point, but it's not a big advantage. Let's see how that develops over time. So that's what I had for you this time. Um, a reminder that this whole series of videos is based on a white paper with the same name, the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems, available on the Waterfall website. Download it if you're interested. We're at the end of the episode. You'll watch the whole episode Give us a like and a subscribe, would you please? Thanks.